from the streets of New York City, Morgan's Policy Radio. Here's Pierce Redman. Okay, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Porkins Policy Radio. As always, I am your host, Pierce Redman. You can find the show here live every Tuesday from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern at ocelli.com. You can also, of course, find the show on my website, which is porkinspolicyreview.com. If you are new to the show, there are lots of ways to listen. You can, of course, find everything uh, archived on my website. All of the new shows are, of course, archived at ocelli.com as well. Uh, you can follow the RSS feed. You can, uh, of course, get email updates. Um, you know, I know people still like to sign up for those as well. You can find that on my website directly. I'm on iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher, Google Play, Podbean, Player FM. I think a, a lot of uh, other small pod catchers out there, pretty much all major and minor pod catchers, will pick up the feed. If there is a, a new one that uh, you, uh, the listeners, uh, use that I don't mention, please let me know so we can link up to it on the uh, website, and I'll, I'll definitely mention it here on the broadcast as well. Uh, I'm also on YouTube, so you can always uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel. If you do use YouTube, um, please do, you know, if you if you enjoy the video, uh, give it a thumbs up. I know that sounds very uh, lame and, and, you know, kind of like a millennial thing to say, but it does help uh, quite a bit. The same goes for iTunes. If you use iTunes, please leave uh, a rating, uh, leave a review if you like the show. Very helpful in terms of, uh, you know, broadening out the show, getting more people interested, search results, all of that kind of stuff. It does go a long way towards helping me and uh, everything that we're doing here on the show. <clears throat> and if you want to support me, if you enjoy uh, the, the show that I do, if you enjoy all the other podcasts, the other projects that I'm involved in, you can always go to patreon.com slash Pierce Redmond, and you can become a subscriber, a patron of mine, for as little as a dollar a month. And that single solitary dollar, of course, gives you access to the monthly exclusive bonus podcast. And I luckily uh, did get the bonus podcast technically in for the month of April. It was the... the um, it was April 30th, I think, uh, is when I actually released it. But it was a continuation of uh, our conversation with legendary radio host and uh, anti-fascist researcher Dave Emery. So definitely check that out. I I forgot to uh, edit the preview clip, so I will uh, probably be doing that tomorrow afternoon, uh, releasing the preview clip from the, the Dave Emery conversation uh, so that people can listen to it. And, uh, of course, you can also... Uh, send a donation. If you, if you don't like to use Patreon, you can always go to, uh, my PayPal link. And again, that is on the main website. You will see it on the upper, uh, left hand corner. And, uh, just click on that. You can give a one time donation, a recurring donation, whatever you like. And, uh, most importantly though, if you love the work that I do, if you like hearing me live on the radio show, if you like the format, um, then I highly, highly encourage you to go to ocelli.com and click on Chuck's donation button. Uh, again, that will send you directly to his PayPal. Give him a donation. You can also sign up on uh, Chuck's Patreon, which, again, is linked up on his website as well. Uh, so if you, if you want to support me even more, I highly encourage you to go and support Chuck uh, because without him, I wouldn't be able to do the show. But um, that is it for me. I have some other small announcements, but, uh, you know, we might save that uh, later on in the show. And uh, I do want to get to uh, our guest. I am very pleased to have writer and journalist Jenna Orkin on the show. Jenna is the author of several books, including Scout, a, me a memoir of investigative journalist Michael C. Rupert, which uh, we might be talking about a little bit later on in the show. Uh, and she's also uh, the author of Ground Zero Wars, The Fight to Reveal the Lies of the EPA in the Wake of 9-11 and Cleanup of Lower Manhattan. We are going to be speaking with Jenna primarily about the World Trade Center dust, the health effects, the uh, cover-up by the EPA to uh, conceal the true devastating nature of the, uh, the, the chemical fallout after 9-11. Uh, but uh, Jenna Orkin, uh, how are you? It's good to have you on the show. Thank you, Pierce. 
Excellent. And um, uh, I'm, I'm glad that we finally got to do this. We, I know we had a, a snafu last week, but uh, I am glad to have you here. Um, Jenna, why don't you tell the, the listeners a little bit about yourself? Who is Jenna Orkin? Oh, I wasn't expecting that question. As you <laughs> said, um, a writer and journalist. And on 9-11, I was an, an innocent um, 9-11 was the second half of my education. Mm. And, uh, Jenna, like uh, you, I, uh, you know, me and my family, uh, lived through 9-11. Um, we actually, we, I know, um, I was, uh, you know, um, checking out, uh, various interviews and, and some of your articles. I know you mentioned, I think it was on the, um, Maybe the interview you did with John Gold that you grew, uh, you're living in Brooklyn. I, uh, still live in Brooklyn, uh, but we, we were certainly living in Brooklyn at the time. I, I have talked about this, um, before on the show, but I'll just do a, a, a quick little recap of it and then I'll throw it to you just because I think it, I mean, it does, um, link in with the type of stuff that you do. But again, as I said, I, me and my family, uh, lived through 9-11. Uh, my mother worked uh, within just a few blocks of the World Trade Center. And in fact, uh, when the towers fell, she was walking over the Brooklyn Bridge uh, when the, the dust cloud sort of overtook them. Uh, when I returned, uh, you know, I went to school at the time in Coney Island. But when we drove uh, finally, uh, you know, after it was quite a while that we were sort of stuck in school, um, when we did drive back, uh, my entire neighborhood, uh, you know, Carroll Gardens, right across the water uh, from Lower Manhattan, was covered in about two inches of white dust and papers. So the the you know um, the the health uh, effects of this dust have, is something that's always kind of been on my mind, uh, and it's something that unfortunately gets overlooked by the research community, by journalists, um, you know, mainstream and alternative. The, the health effects seem to sort of uh, take a, you know, a back seat or, or many times are just sort of forgotten entirely. But, um, Jenna, before we kind of get into, uh, you know, everything uh, related to this, tell the listeners a little, you know, what was, um, you know, what was the day of 9-11 like for you? Where were you? How did the day unfold? Well, I was in Brooklyn, but, you know, you said your mother was crossing the bridge. Is she okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, as far as far as I know, yeah, um, she is okay. I mean, she was, you know, um, she made it o- over the bridge. Um, but uh, certainly, it's it's something that has, you know, it's always in the back of my mind. Uh, I mean, the same thing. I, I mean, the like I said, the dust was all over my neighborhood as well. Yes, I was referring to the health effects for her. Mm. She was in the dust cloud. I mean, you're aware of Michael Barish, the lawyer. Uh, she can sign up with him mm. and possibly get compensated. So I wanted to tell you that. Oh, no, thank you, you Dad. Yeah, you asked me what I was doing. I was on my way to the gym, and a neighbor came out of the apartment. Now, you know, being a New Yorker, we don't, we're polite. We say mm. hi, but we don't it, converse. <laughs> and he broke the silence to say, did you hear about the World Trade Center? A plane flew into it. They think it might be terrorists. And so we both looked out the window and saw the smoke. And... Um, I reversed course, went back to the apartment, and immediately called my son's school because it was four blocks north of the World Trade Center. And that line was busy, busy, busy. And so then I tried to cross the bridge. First, I tried to take the subway. They'd close that off. I tried to walk across the bridge. That was not possible any longer either. So then I waited to give blood at the Red Cross, and the line was snaking around the block. You know, everybody had the same idea. Mm -hmm. everybody from all walks of life. So I went back home, and by that time, my cousin called and said they're evacuating Stuyvesant, my son's school, which turned out to be premature. Um, And eventually my son called on his teacher's cell phone because he didn't have one. No, the kids didn't have them at that time. It was 9-11 that caused a kind of revolution in cell phone (laughs) ownership. And he just said that... They were evacuated at about 10.30. He didn't tell me all this in that phone call. But what happened was that he was in physics class, and when the first plane hit, the kids rushed to the window, 
And guess what the physics teacher did? He closed the blinds, proceeded with the lesson. So, you know, there's a <laughs> building on fire down there. And um, lots of, there are lots of stories like that. You know, there were some kids looking through the window of a spare classroom and a teacher came by to chastise them and they just pointed out the window and the teacher burst into tears. Um, what happened was that When the first plane hit, the FBI showed up at the school, and the principal of the school said, should we evacuate them? The FBI said, no, we don't know who's out in the streets. It could be more terrorists, so just keep them inside, which is what they did. And then when the second plane hit, the FBI changed its mind and said the vib- – oh, when the, I'm sorry, when the building fell, the FBI changed their mind and said there's a chance that the vibrations could bring down the Stuyvesant High School building, so you must evacuate. Now, this was 3,200 kids, and uh, they did it, and when they got downstairs, there was a – administrator called Renee Levine, and she just said, you see that person to your right or your left? I don't care if you know them. That's your buddy. Keep track of them and run north. Those were the instructions, and that's what they did. It wasn't the stupidest thing to say. And my son ended up walking five miles that day carrying 26 pounds of books. I later weighed them because he hadn't gotten his act together to get a locker. And... um, he assures me he was not caught in the cloud, which is either true, although the cloud, they say, was moving at 35 miles an hour, or perhaps not true, and he's trying to protect me. Um, so that was the day. And, I, I mean, again, I, I've told these stories before uh, about the day of, I mean, and just the the, the chaos uh, that ensued. A good friend of mine, um, you know, uh, my good friend of mine, we went to the same middle school together. Uh, his older brother wa- was in Stuyvesant at the time. And uh, it was actually his mother that drove all the way out to Coney Island to pick us up. And she had no idea uh, where her older son was. Uh, I assume something, you know, similar uh, to what uh, was going on for you as well, Jen. I mean, there was such insanity nobody knew how to handle this um but you know and in the aftermath of that there are all these sort of you know questions about who was responsible uh what was going on how could this happen and yet there is this you know uh figurative and literal cloud over all of this that is the 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 physical dust the debris Everything, I mean, people can, you know, look up the, if they choose to, I mean, I I don't encourage it, you know, the images of people covered in dust. I mean, again, as I said, my entire neighborhood was two inches of of white powder papers from the building. Um, And this is essentially what kind of led you uh, to research the health effects of this, right? Is, is, is the fact that your son went to Stuyvesant and um, was down there and maybe we can kind of use that to sort of begin this conversation. I mean, uh, before we even get to the initial response from the city um, and and, uh, ultimately the federal government regarding the air quality, Stuyvesant made a big deal about wanting to reopen, correct? Absolutely correct. And that includes the kids who were, they love the school, it's an incredible school, and their parents who were very ambitious, plus the mindset, the zeitgeist of the entire fucking world, which was show the motherfuckers and, um, you know, get back into business and rebuild the towers bigger and better. And uh, and Bloomberg, Mayor Bloomberg, was telling everybody to go shopping. So that was the kind of spirit. And dare anybody say Giuliani, anything else. right? Uh, you're right. It was Giuliani, and mm. you're absolutely right. And Bloomberg was three months later. Yes. But anyway, um, if you dared have a, an alternative opinion, you were viewed uh, frowned upon greatly and drowned out entirely, and viewed as a hysterical mother. Mm. Yeah, and you know, I I, I remember um, you know finally getting home. Uh, on that day and just, I mean, wiped. I know you've, you've told this, the story before, um, 
your your son just sort of like collapsed at like a diner, right, with like a, a family friend, um, just out of the the exhaustion. I felt very similar. I mean, I remember, um, you know, getting home and my mom was there along with a very close friend of hers who, uh, you know, they worked together, and they were both, you know, pretty freaked out and uh you know it's, everyone was hysterical i remember sort of just like crying profusely in my room wondering why this had happened and then just kind of like passing out and then it was like i think we maybe had like you know one day off and then it was we're back to school and i'm not saying that that's necessarily a bad thing i think kids need structure especially during a traumatic event and for a lot of kids school can be that structure but there was this um you know I don't remember there ever being an issue of like um even beyond the, the sort of physical health effects the mental health effects of this um and that there was that weird patriotism to you know get back to school and like you said to keep shopping and stuff like that um you know when I, I mean I don't even know how you could go about, you know, buying a new TV or a car, um, you know, a, a few weeks after this horrific event. Um, but it, explain it, explain a little bit about, um, you know, the, that sort of mentality at Stuyvesant in particular, because I know you've talked about, you know, you and a few other uh, parents within the Parents Association had serious questions, um, just, to, you know, basic things. I mean, the, the I, people may not really understand. I mean, Stuyvesant is like spitting distance from the World Trade Center that was still smoking. Um, when when did when did your son go back to school? Maybe early October, right? Absolutely. What they did was put the kids in Brooklyn Tech, and they doubled up with the population of Brooklyn Tech. So one group went in the morning, and the other went in the afternoon. Plus, there was some overlap. And an enormous amount of, um, hus well, I won't say enormous, but there were certain incidents of hostility between the two schools because they're competitive, mm. and it was just too crowded. You know, there were some classes that were being held in the auditorium with multiple other classes held in the same place at the same time. Mm. So anyway, that was one of the reasons and that there was a great movement to return to the building. And um, very widely shared, there were very few parents who were against it. And those who were, and including the kids who were, were told if you transfer out, you cannot come back to Stuyvesant. And that uh, quelled that little rebellion, quashed it immediately. Um, when they went back on October 9th, the day after Columbus Day, the head of the Department of Education, Harold Levy, set up an office to show everybody how safe it was. And of mm. course, he only stayed for a week. It was a pure photo op. But one girl said to him, I don't feel safe here because of the air. And he told her, well, fine, transfer out and then you can't come back. Okay, by Friday, he's gone. She decides to stay so as not to forfeit Stuyvesant. By February, that girl had to have two spinal taps to relieve the pressure of fluid buildup in her brain from what was diagnosed as pseudotumor cerebri, which is not exactly a brain tumor. It isn't. But uh, you don't want spinal taps, and you don't want that condition. And is there anything, you know, at the school in terms of safety or a cleanup effort? I mean, was the school, you know, I don't even want to, I mean, vacuumed for dust? I mean, I know, <laughs> I, you know, is there, I, I don't know quite what the, you know, what, I mean, I don't know what, what you would have to do. But I mean, was anything done in order to get the school uh, clean to some degree, or was it like a lot of lower Manhattan down there that was still just sort of, you know, debris everywhere? They did what they called a million dollar asbestos abatement. Well, I'm sure it was a million dollars. And um, it was very far from an ideal real asbestos abatement because what we didn't find out for several months after the kids returned and it was too late was that in this supposed first rate cleanup, they overlooked or omitted the ventilation system. Hmm. Now, what happened was when the kids went back to Stuyvesant, not only did they have the World Trade Center that was on fire for at least three months, 
burning, smoldering, and smoldering is more dangerous than burning because of the dioxins, etc. But they also had the barge on their north doorstep, which was a transportation device to take the debris to Staten Island and elsewhere, from which it was transported to third world countries. And in December, I got an email from Korea saying, we're getting all this debris, is it toxic? And I said, Mm. yes, but don't feel discriminated against because they're doing the same thing to us. Well, anyway, so it had this abatement, but it was a farce of an abatement. And um, we learned that too late. Uh, And then the school, the Parents Association, threatened to sue the Board of Education, and we had the assistance of Richard Benveniste, who had been one of the lawyers at Watergate, and um, he was a Stuyvesant graduate, so he offered pro bono assistance, which the head of the Parents Association, Marilena Christodoulou, gladly took up, and Saul Stern, who brought Benveniste to her. So they threatened the Board of Education, and... um, Therefore, in the summer of '02, there was another real, more real cleanup. Mm. But uh, now, what? Yeah. No, no, go ahead, Jenna. I'm sorry. Okay, what this leads into, dovetails into, is um, the bogus kind of testing that they did to determine mm. that places and the air was really clean. If you want to raise that issue, yeah. Well, I I, I wanted to get to that, um, but well, you know, maybe we can we can do that now um, because uh, even with this second cleanup, um, sure, maybe they are physically cleaning the school, um, and uh, that's you know, oh, I mean, that's better than nothing. But I mean, there it like you can't vacuum the air necessarily you know i mean there's there's a lot more that has to kind of go into that and that um i think is very uh you know it's indicative of the the sort of official government response to a lot of this was well if we just get rid of the dust you know um like the physical dust like clumps of it then everything is okay um not thinking of what's you know what can you not see that's floating around in the air uh and and i know too like like Stuyvesant, um, uh, you, you took like carpet samples and things like that. And there was, you know, it was way, you know, way above the, 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 whatever normal limits for things like asbestos and other sort of dioxins. And this is, you know, after at least one of the cleanups that went on there. Um, and I guess before we even, we, we get into specifically that, um, let's just, just talk about, I mean, uh, the basic thing. I mean, what was actually in the air? Let's talk about, uh, for instance, I mean, the, the, the chemicals and the substances. Uh, we've, we've mentioned asbestos a couple of times. Uh, it's no secret that, um, the, the World Trade Center was filled with, uh, asbestos. Um, you know, something that they had been told to, you know, clean and get rid of, but they, you know, continually put it off. But, um, there's also massive amounts of lead, mercury. There's radioactive material that was in, um, you know, inside the, the World Trade Center. I think this came mostly from like smoke detectors. Um, talk a little bit about this, Jen. I mean, what was in these two buildings? Okay, first of all, you you raised so many interesting questions. Um, I wanted to say about the ventilation system that that was the only source of air. And you're absolutely right, because when the kids were down there going to school, the solution to any pollution was just simply close the window. And then they opened the ventilation system, which sucked in the air from the barge, where all the toxic debris was being brought. And they were violating regulations, all kinds of environmental regulations on the local, state, and federal levels in order to achieve this because the cleanup and the speed of it took precedence over absolutely everything. And in fact, the same day that Stuyvesant reopened, the same day, October 9th, now I have this in the book, Um, Governor Pataki issued an executive order to suspend um, the need to comply with hazardous waste management standards. Okay, so they're letting the kids back in school, and now it doesn't matter that they violate them because that rule has been suspended. So you asked what's in the air. Well, 
hundreds of tons of asbestos because it was used on at least one of the towers until it became illegal to build with it. And um, the way that they managed to lie about what the amount of asbestos was was that they used antiquated equipment, 20 years old, so that for every fiber that the EPA found, independent scientists found nine, nine times as much. So the risk of cancer from the asbestos alone was one person in ten. The Sierra Club report says that there were at least 2,000 contaminants, I forget the exact number they gave, um, that were in the air. And, of course, some of these contaminants created new uh, products that have never before been seen because they kind of mate mm. in the high uh, heat levels. So the EPA ignored that. They ignored additive effects of being exposed to this and that and that. They also ignored synergistic effects. So if you were exposed, you know, if the, let's say – the EPA says that uh, an exposure to a certain level of asbestos is acceptable in an urban setting. But that won't be true if you're also exposed to, as you said, mercury, lead, and 2,000 other things. All right. Um, the tens of thousands of fluorescent light bulbs each contain 41 milligrams of mercury, which will make you stupider. Um, it's a highly toxic material. There were 50,000 computers each made with at least four pounds of lead. And the smoke detectors, as you mentioned, contained radioactive americium-241. Then there's the alkaline level of the air, which was equivalent to that of drain cleaner. And uh, a month following the disaster, Dr. Thomas Cahill came from the University of California at Davis, and did tests for very and ultrafine particulates. His results were the highest that he'd ever recorded in the course of taking 7,000 samples around the world, including at the burning Kuwaiti oil fields. Um, Dr. Marjorie Clark, who was a great hero, at this point, said 9-11 was equivalent to dozens of asbestos factories, incinerators, and crematoria, as well as a volcano. So those are the highlights, and plus we had record <laughs> levels of dioxin, PCBs, and everything else. And also, just on top of that, uh, you're talking about, I don't know how many tons of just concrete being pulverized going into the air you know i mean i'm i'm jumping a little bit ahead but uh you know i was watching um the um uh it was a uh a testimony in congress on the air contamination at ground zero this happened i think it was 2006 uh gerald nadler uh chaired it i'm sure we'll get to that a little bit later but uh, you know one of the um you know experts there uh suzanne Mate, who Mate. was a uh, Mate, yeah i mean you know, just in her opening remarks, and she was the uh, New York City field office d director for the Sierra Club. I mean, she just, you know, mentioned just the concrete alone is extremely dangerous. You know, if it was nothing but just regular, I mean, I'm asthmatic. Dust in general bothers me. You know, if there was all of this, if lead, mercury, all these other things weren't in there, just the physical concrete dust alone would be extremely dangerous for anyone with a respiratory illness or, or disease or anything, you know, just young children, anything like that. Um, but when you factor in all the other stuff, I mean, the, you know, steel, um, I mean, just think about like the amount of, you know, styrofoam cups and all, all sorts of other, there's so much stuff. I mean, people really forget quite how large the Twin Towers were, how much stuff was packed into... I mean, they're like little cities, almost, um, you know, yes, w within. It was a, a city with its own zip code. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and just the... the When you really kind of just think logically, I mean, that was another interesting thing um, that uh, uh, Suzanne Maté said, uh, was just, you know, your common sense in the back of your mind tells you this is not right. 
that what I'm smelling is freaking me out. And just your common sense of well, a building just collapsed. There's no way that dust is is good for you. You know, there's there's nothing positive about it. Yet, uh, as we will you know discuss now, maybe the EPA continually um, lied and you know manipulated uh, data to kind of give a, an opposite response. And I mean, let's just talk a little bit about, um, you know, I know you mentioned the uh, that they were using antiquated ways of measuring uh, the air quality. But I also want to talk a little bit about the, the logarithmic scale of measurement. Um, and also the um, this number gets batted around a lot, about 1% asbestos. And that seems... I'm still kind of confused as to what that means. Like 1% asbestos is like tolerable by EPA standards. Can you explain that, Jenna? I hope I can. Uh, thank you. Um, I believe that the 1% asbestos standard only applies to intact materials. So let's say you have, I don't know what, a wall or something. Uh, that's 1% asbestos. Well, as long as it's standing and it's solid, there's no dust, so you're not going to breathe it. But mm. let's say somebody bumps into a wall and then one fiber is removed and floats around in the air and somebody breathes it. Okay, that's where the 1% standard comes in. That is what is tolerable when the material is intact. In other words, we have to, we, we cannot be absolutely purist about all this. Um, we're exposed to toxic materials in the city. It's a fact of life, even in the country, but much less. So 1% is for intact materials, but you're quite right to point out that in the case of the World Trade Center, none of it's intact. It's all been pulverized. <laughs> Nevertheless, the EPA used the 1% standard and applied it to this pulverized material, which is all inhalable. That was the point, and that was the way in which they lied. And um, you have to be at all the hearings and you have to talk to the experts before you understand this. So now you're getting to the logarithmic scale. And it frightens me that I'm the person explaining this <laughs> stuff because it's not my background. Um, so it, when they say, let's say, that the level of alkalinity is 11, because I believe that the cutoff was 11.5. So if they say it's 11, it's under the threshold and it's acceptable. Um, and what EPA did was they said, oh, we found that it's only 11, it's not 11.5. And that sounds like a very small, inconsequential change of, you know, half a point. But on a logarithmic scale, the difference between 10 and 11 is not a difference of let's say 10%. It doesn't work like that. It's a difference of 10 times. <laughs> so a logarithmic scale doesn't go 1, 2, 3. It goes 1, 10, 100, 1,000. It goes in multiples of 10. So when there was an article in the New York Times reporting, as the media did, good news, um, they never explained what this small... Uh, seemingly unimportant change meant. Maybe they didn't know themselves. That would be even more scary. Well, I mean, it's, I think it's their their job and prerogative to know uh, what the difference is. Um, but yeah, the, the the that alone, I think, is uh, what makes this such a, a difficult topic to comprehend. Is there's a lot of science and math involved. Two things I'm not uh, very you know learned on. But um, the, the logarith logarithmic scale of measurement is so important. And I think that that's also why, like, when you're talking about 1% asbestos versus 1.5% asbestos, it's a huge difference. I mean, you're, you're talking about, you know, whatever, uh, your, your chances of getting cancer uh, from a, a slight change in the percentage of asbestos in the air is, I mean, through the roof uh, once you get beyond that 1% in the intact material. Um, yeah. I mean, when you go from one to 1 1.5, you've increased by uh, 50%. Yeah. I, I mean, it's uh, cr crazy to think. Um, now we've got all this stuff in the air. 
Um, the cleanup is going on. Uh, people may have forgotten, but the the physic you know the physical pile of uh, the World Trade Center. I mean that burned for months uh, yeah. after the towers fell. So uh, it's not as if um, I mean again now you're getting smoke. Uh, coming, you know, up into the air along with the dust. I mean, this is not helping at all. The smell is pretty atrocious and foul. People can smell it as far away as, you know, uh, I don't know, you know, you know, 10 block radius, uh, from ground zero. Uh, you know, I do remember, uh, just, I mean, like when the, you know, when the winds would change, you could get a whiff of it even over in Brooklyn occasionally. Um, I mean, this was a huge, uh, disaster. Uh, there, like you, you mentioned before, you know, that, uh, Governor Pataki had given all sorts of, you know, uh, basically, I don't know what dispensations, you know, they didn't have to follow, uh, the, the regular guidelines and regulations. Uh, at the time, you know, OSHA was not enforcing any, uh, th- things in terms of respirators. Um, you know, the, the head of OSHA at the time, John Henshaw, has made these idiotic claims that there that, that really wasn't all that much asbestos in the air um, and that OSHA, you know, would have had to sue the city of New York to get them to wear respirators. And they didn't, you know, this seemed uh, like they didn't want to do this or, or whatever. Um, how long after 9-11, you know, were people becoming ill? And, and really getting sick. And I mean, we're, right now we're talking mainly about the first responders, people who are down there. How long did it take for people to get ill? Well, I know most about Stuyvesant, and that will give you some indication. Um, hmm. Obviously, it's different illnesses and different people at different times. But I can tell you that at Stuyvesant, while the Board of Education said we're not seeing any elevated trips to the nurse, that was absolutely patently false. People gave up going to the nurse because the line was too long or they'd get in trouble or something like that. But um, at the Stuyvesant Parents Association meetings, Marilena Christodoulou said, well, how many parents here have children who are sick? And about, I think it was about a third of the parents raised their hands. And that was just the people at that meeting. So... um, Out of 3,200 people, it would be an enormous number. And the illnesses were generally at that point respiratory. So those were the immediate effects. Uh, Later on, you get the more, I'm not going to say serious, but the other effects, the neurological, cardiac, everything else. Mm. And uh, again, uh, maybe you you can speak a little bit to this, uh, Jenna, but the, the, The regulations and all this stuff being, you know, I I mentioned before, I mean, like, for instance, I mean, they were, um, correct me if I'm wrong, they were telling uh, some of the first responders, they were they were told not to wear respirators, because they would they would freak out people, you know, average New Yorkers, right? Yeah, um, I believe it was Lieutenant Manuel Gomez, who said that he wanted to bring respirators. He was very knowledgeable, and he'd invented some kind of little device to detect chemicals. He wanted to bring a respirator. He brought it, and they wouldn't let him wear it because it was, you know, bad for business. It was, as you said, it freaks people out. Don't frighten the horses. Right, and and I do wonder if that's, you know, some of the, uh, the, the I don't know, desire like on OSHA not to, uh, you know, send out a blanket, at least a blanket statement saying that they should wear respirators is linked to that. And that kind of uh, leads me to this, you know, uh, the the more political side of the the cleanup itself. And perhaps this is what really contributed to the lack of a substantial cleanup is talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the economic uh, political side of this. There was this desire not only to reopen Stuyvesant, uh, you know, but also to reopen Wall Street, to give the finger to bin Laden and Al Qaeda that everything was fine. You can't defeat us. We're, we're back and, and, you know, better than ever. And again, I, I mean, you know, I don't think most of my listeners out there, myself included, uh, are not, you know, huge fans of, you know, Wall Street bankers and stuff, but they were down there really quickly, uh, breathing in all this stuff as well. 
uh, and, and and I don't I would never wish that on anyone. Talk about just the the kind of political economic uh, desire to get uh, Wall Street back up and running. See, I don't know what was going on in their heads, but you're absolutely right. You said it that um, they reopened very quickly. It was the following week. And it was a show of great triumph. There was a lot of media collusion in all of this, I have to say. And they weren't questioning. They were following in lockstep everything the government was telling them. God forbid you should do anything else. (laughs) Um, So I have in the book some reports from the media which illustrate that, including the New York Times that said the persistent pall of smoke wafting from the remains of the World Trade Center poses a very small and steadily diminishing risk to the public, environmental officials and doctors said yesterday. The New York Times had several articles like that reporting good news, and even doctors were endorsing that message. Uh, Here's a quote. We we anticipated a big problem, said Dr. Gillian Shepard, an allergy immunology specialist at Weill Cornell. But thank heavens it didn't happen. There are um, many others saying the same thing. And any doctor who said otherwise, and there were a few, were relegated to the back pages of the more despised papers. No, the, the, um, the media, uh, I don't know, cooperation or uh, collusion. Collusion. Yeah, <laughs> collusion with this is, again, it is so disturbing and it does speak to the rah-rah American patriotism that infected everybody. But again, I mean, the, 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 it really is like Juan Gonzalez, uh, Daily News, is probably the only person actively uh, or, or with any sort of, you know, uh, clout. Uh, we're talking, you know, one of the, the three biggest newspapers in New York City talking about this. Uh, but aside from that, everyone... Um, just sort of went along with what the EPA was saying. And there's something so insidious about it when you can just, again, if you were down there, if you smelled what was happening, if you saw the dust covering, you know, lower Manhattan, parts of, of South Brooklyn, you, you know instinctively in the back of your head, this is dangerous. There's no way that this is, is safe. Um, yet, I mean, we can just get to it. I mean, uh, um, Whitman, head of the EPA, coming out and saying the air is safe to breathe. I mean, let's let's just jump into that, Jenna. Right. Uh, the first time she said it was September <coughs> 13th, and again on the 18th. And Giuliani then was very happy to parrot that message, saying, you know, I know you would think it's, it smells so bad, it's got to <laughs> be bad, but they tell us it's safe. And they're the experts. And the way that people just swallowed the party line uh, was also a little troubling. I wanted to read one more quote from this newspaper article. The best remedy, said the experts, talking about the pollution, is to drink lots of water. Um, But as you said, Juan Gonzalez was the sole lone voice to the contrary and he was roundly punished for it he would his first article on october 26 toxic zone was on the front page with huge letters and um after that whitman complained and they gave her an outlet to write her own editorial which she did and then juan gonzalez you didn't see him on the front page for a very long time (laughs) yeah then When the Ground Zero workers started to fall ill, his paper did an excellent job of covering it. And I believe that, I don't want to be inaccurate, but um, they got some kind of major prize for it. And yet, Juan Gonzalez is not mentioned. He could have prevented it if they had let him, if the city had let him, if the Daily News had let him. Mm. And, and I mean, now we're, we're, we're kind of into the realm of speculation. You or I are not, uh, in, uh, you know, Christine Todd Whitman's mind. And, and, but I mean, what possessed her to say the air quality was, it was fine to breathe. And I mean, at that time that she said that those, whatever, three occasions, and then you've got Giuliani, of course, you know, just parroting whatever. 
uh, the government says. I mean, did Whitman know for a fact that that was an inaccurate statement? Or is this, you know, like she said later, um, you know, before Congress in 2006 that, you know, no, the readings that I had at the time were, you know, showed that the, the science was, was good and that everything was safe. Did she, you know, knowingly lie? And I mean, maybe this is a silly or a straightforward question, but did she know she was lying? Um, there's no way she could not have known. EPA is in that business. Mm. The fact that they focused only on asbestos is lie number one. So if you can say, you know, our readings show uh, an acceptable level of asbestos, well, that's true. But she's not telling you what we discussed before, which was that they were using the wrong equipment, and then what they did later was use maybe the right equipment, but in, they purposefully put it in a place where they knew they would not find asbestos, or part of the test was to test the air, as you mentioned before. And they had to turn on fans. They would bring the fans into the room and they wouldn't turn them on or they'd have the fan facing the wrong direction, facing the wall. I mean, the way they played with their own tests was um, as though taunting us. And you mentioned also that we had the carpet tested at Stuyvesant. We did that using an EPA-developed test called ultrasonication, which EPA never recommended <laughs> to residents for their own apartments. It was their own test, and they said the results are too speculative. But we did the test, and we came up with, I think it was 2.3 million structures per square centimeter. Well, speculative or not, that was considered by every expert we consulted to, be, uh, to require an abatement. So technically, and I think I'm giving her too much credit, technically you could say it wasn't a lie. We, they didn't find asbestos. But if you don't look, then of right. course you're not going right. to find. Right, right. Well, no, I, I mean, that, that's just sort of the classic, uh, you know, I mean, I'm laughing. and it's, I mean, it's not, it's just, it's so disturbing. You, you kind of have to. But, I mean, that's just a classic government, uh, you know, just a mindset of, uh, well, no, we didn't. You know, we didn't really find anything. Now, our tests, you know, uh, on retrospect, maybe the tests weren't good. But at the time, you know, uh, yeah, there was no there was no asbestos in the air, um, which is also just wild thinking that, you know, Whitman is, was down there. EPA um, workers were down there. I, I mean, she didn't even seem to care about their safety, let alone the yeah. millions of people that live in New York City. Um, and no, but you know what EPA did? They gave an asbestos abatement to their own lobby in yes. their own building. They didn't right. give it to residents who were – and they were not within the zone considered at risk. Oh, which is even more – I mean, because then it really is just, I mean, what what is the actual zone? Uh, you, you know? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, I mean, it, no, no, it, it's uh, – it's, I mean, Chris, Christine Todd Whitman of, of, of uh, many of the people uh, – we'll, we'll – Explore this a bit more in the second hour for sure, but I mean, in terms of uh, you know some of the criminals that should be in jail uh, because uh, of uh, you know the events of 9/11, uh, Whitman is, is totally up there. I, I mean, it just I mean you're, you're talking about poisoning theoretically millions of people um, in order to reopen Lower Manhattan or or at least to you know give this image that everything is okay and. Uh, I mean, again, I, the EPA used to be like a legitimate governmental organization. And now, I mean, I mean, since 9-11, I mean, it just can't bode well for them uh, in terms of uh, – I mean, it makes me think about like other natural disasters or, or man-made disasters, um, you know, dealing with pollutants and chemicals. How much is the EPA really paying attention to what's going on when arguably the biggest – you know, one of the biggest ecological disasters we've seen in, I don't know, decades, if not more. Uh, they, they completely kind of just, um, you know, swept it under the rug. Um, you know, I know we're getting up towards the, the end of the, uh, the the first hour here. Um, and maybe briefly we can just kind of uh, uh, touch on it and we can expand it a little bit more after the break. But Christine Todd Whitman also had a conflict of interest when it came to all of this, um, 
Jenna, tell us just a little bit about uh, Christine Todd Whitman's connection to Citigroup. Well, her husband had shares of Citigroup, which insured uh, a bunch of lower Manhattan. I was going to try and Google that, um, but I can't do two things at the same time. So that was her conflict of interest. There was hundreds of thousands of dollars at stake for that family. Well, yeah, wasn't it? It's like through travelers insurance or something like that. Yeah. Right. Yeah, um, and she should have recused herself from the case, but she didn't. And to your knowledge, was this ever like brought up in any of the congressional hearings? It was brought up at the EPA ombudsman's hearing, and the EPA ombudsman was um, one of Christine Todd Whitman's dearest enemies. <laughs> uh, that was Robert Martin, who was originally a McCaw Indian, and Hugh Kaufman was his chief investigator. They held hearings starting in February, and um, these were the first hearings that did not allow the government to testify first. That was a very major feature of the other hearings because the government said, we're not going to come at all if you don't let us testify first, and they knew what they were doing. They knew that the press would take a soundbite from them and then be all set to go off and edit their tapes. So when legitimate scientists like Marjorie Clark, Paul Bartlett testified, there was nobody there to hear them. Uh, the ombudsman hearing did the opposite of that. And that's like one of the, the few actual, um, I don't know, chastised, public chastisements of the EPA um, uh, along with uh, there was a uh, federal judge who gave a pretty damning assessment of uh, Todd Whitman's time at EPA as well. And that was over, later overturned, I believe, um, but that right. was a, a suit against the EPA. Um, but, uh, you know, they have kind of gotten away, <laughs> I don't know, scot-free for the most part. Um, now, beyond... Uh, Whitman's connections to Citigroup and, think, you know, the sort of conflict of interest. Um, do you know of anything, you know, related to Giuliani having any kind of conflicts of interest? I know he, you know, um, he, uh, you know, was, was instrumental in carting away a lot of the debris or in helping facilitate it, um, you know, and getting rid of what is essentially evidence of a crime. Um, you know, is there anything um, that you know of specific with Rudy Giuliani in terms of the cleanup and uh, any kind of conflicts of interest? So um, I wonder what you're driving at there. But Giuliani got into an enormous amount of trouble with the firemen. And when he was running for president, I think they put the kibosh on that campaign by showing up and pointing out that he had endorsed the use of Motorola radios, and that was why the firemen were killed on 9-11 in, so, in greater numbers than the police, because their radios were not compatible and didn't work adequately in the towers. He had done that against the advice of people who knew better, and also putting his own emergency uh, headquarters into World Trade Center 7, which was against the advice of city councilwoman Catherine Freed. So um, for other information on Giuliani, I'd strongly recommend Mike Rupert's Crossing the Rubicon. Go to mm. the index, look up Giuliani. There's a lot of material there. Yeah, and, and, and certainly, uh, I mean, he is just a, a real bad penny uh, continually showing up and, of course, continually... Uh, I mean, milking the trauma of 9-11 for political and financial gain uh, when it comes to, you know, he's got these stupid consulting companies and and obviously now he's uh, somehow a counsel to the, you know, president. Um, it truly uh, uh, disturbing. Um, well, I think um, we will uh, take a break here in a few moments and we will continue this conversation in the second hour. We are speaking with Jenna Orkin. Jenna is a writer and journalist. Uh, she has written several books, including Scout, a memoir of investigative journalist Michael C. Rupert and Ground Zero Wars, the fight to reveal the lies of the EPA in the wake of 9-11 and clean up lower Manhattan. And uh, there is uh, still 
a bit more uh, to discuss when it comes to all of this. Uh, certainly, um, I want to get to uh, the White House Council on Environmental Quality, um, which uh, it is uh, one of these uh, organizations that uh, is little known but played a huge role in uh, helping to uh, cover up and uh, you know, excuse the EPA and, and many times kind of overruling them. But um, I think we will um, uh, take a quick break here and we will continue the conversation in the second hour with uh, Jenna Orkin. So please stay tuned. Oh, and uh, it, well, we might actually still be live. Um, uh, so I guess I will uh, uh, fill the, the, the time a little bit. Um, Chuck might be uh, away from the computer, so not able to... Uh, cut us into the commercial. Um, so uh, I guess uh, we will uh, continue a little bit right here. Um, I guess uh, first and foremost, Jenna, maybe you can um, uh, briefly just uh, tell us what is the White House Council on Environmental Quality? Well, it's an organization that at that time was run by a man called James Connaughton, and they were – editing EPA's press releases, we know of one or two occasions where they changed EPA's cautionary statements about asbestos to reassurances, which is like turning a no into a yes. Um, so they were highly influential in this, and uh, James Connaughton has his fingerprints on all kinds of things, like lies about climate change. He was behind that. Mm. Um, a very powerful, dark horse, shadowy figure. Yes, absolutely. And and so is his, um, I guess maybe not, uh, he's still sort of in the, the, the public light, his uh, chief of communication, Samuel Thernstrom, uh, is another, you know, one of these, I mean, you know, slimy, uh, nasty, uh, you know, people just sort of working in the background. The, the White House Council on, Environment, on Environmental Quality was also, um, you know, certainly behind a lot of the political, um, you know, decisions in terms of uh, language and stuff like that being changed uh, within the EPA report. Um, and, I mean, you know... Maybe we can we can uh, uh, talk a little bit about this. I mean the the, the fact that um, things like uh, what, what what was the, the famous example? Um, I forget what it is, but it was like they changed like a very important word essentially in uh, EPA press releases. I believe they were also behind some of the press releases that that you know that came out from the EPA that said just you could clean. Um, the dust in your house with a wet rag. Is that correct? Yeah. They were telling people that because the EPA says it's safe, it's um, fine for residents to clean up their own apartments with a wet mop or a wet rag and where the dust is really bad, wear long pants. And so residents duly did that and suffered health effects as a consequence. But, um, had they done the right thing, everybody would have gotten an, a, a real asbestos abatement, which would have cost approximately $2 billion, which is nothing for the federal government, but they didn't do it. And it's my belief, of course, you can't know what goes on in people's heads, that they did it in order to establish a new precedent, because prior to 9-11, EPA did clean up things you know, after disasters, so that only one person in a million would get cancer from whatever the contaminant was, and usually it was only one contaminant at a time. In the case of 9-11, they, cha they changed the criteria so that it would be, what's a hundred times that? A hundred people out of a million, that's one in 10,000. Uh, that that level of cancer cases would be acceptable. Plus, you had, as we said before, over 2,000 contaminants. And um, you want to do a little riff, or me to do a little riff about synergy at this point? Oh, please. Yeah, 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 yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I love it. Uh, synergy is how contaminants work together. And it's not merely one and one and one. 
when you get two of them together, for instance, if you're an asbestos worker and a smoker, that's not just twice as bad as being an asbestos worker or a smoker. The work at Mount Sinai has determined that it's 80 or 90 times as bad. Synergy means working together. The way they work together, they have an explosive effect. Um, it was another facet that was entirely overlooked by EPA, and we would bring it up again and again like everything else, and every time we had a meeting with them or another conference at which they appeared, it was always back to square one, and they would say, we didn't find any asbestos. Um, what did you ask about the White House Council on Environmental Quality? Well, you know what, Jenna, why don't we, we, we can take a break here um, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll pick this up because I do want to explore the uh, the White House Council on Environmental Quality in terms of the, you know, the, the changing of statements, the political kind of nature uh, to this and, uh, you know, why, in fact, uh, they were allowed to do this. So we will continue this conversation with Jenna Orkin in the second hour. So please stay tuned. <laughs> out of the subway in New York City. Yeah, baby. The radio show that never sleeps. Orkin's Policy Radio with Pierce Redman. Gold, silver, the stock market. Wall Street Window. The brilliant author of The War State brings you exclusive reports about the big changes upcoming in the markets. Wall Street Window. Perhaps you're invested deeply. Perhaps you're not in deep enough. Maybe you're thinking about getting started. WallStreetWindow.com Michael Swanson, the brilliant author of The War State, understood these trends professionally for many years, and now he gives you the benefit of his knowledge. WallStreetWindow.com Go there now. Go there now. Go there now. News, entertainment, and more. You will learn something, children. Ocelli.com Broadcasting worldwide. Trans Resistor Radio. Morning, morning, morning. I'll go with the podcast. The Ocelli Effect. Jeffrey. Ah. Orkin's Policy Radio with Pierce Redman. On Ocelli.com. Now back to the man, Pierce Redman. Okay, everybody, welcome back to Porkins Policy Radio. I am your host, Pierce Redman. If you are joining us here in the second hour, we are speaking with writer and journalist Jenna Orkin, of course, the author of Ground Zero Wars, the fight to reveal the lies of the EPA in the, week, in the wake of 9-11 and cleanup of Lower Manhattan. We have uh, been, of course, discussing the health issues related to the World Trade Center dust, the cover-up of the EPA, and so forth. I just um, quickly want to give a big shout-out to uh, John Gold, who um, helped set up this interview uh, between Jenna and I. And uh, John is, uh, of course, a frequent guest on this show and uh, I, you know, just a, a huge thank you to John for all the work that he does 
Um, and in fact, I probably would have never heard of you, Jenna, had it not been for John Gold. And, um, you know, he is always singing your praises. Um, and he is an absolute encyclopedia about yes. 9-11. He's unbelievable. <laughs> uh, oh, absolutely. I, I mean, we, we have like an, you know, uh, on our like, uh, you know, private messages on Twitter. I mean, half of them are, you know, little, I'll just ask him a question and then he'll just, you know, he'll go on and on and he'll send me videos and all sorts of stuff. I mean, he really is a encyclopedic, uh, you know, knowledge of 9-11 and, and what happened, you know, before and after and, uh, you know, all sorts of stuff. So again, people should go check out all of John Gold's, uh, work. I'll link up to that, um, in the, the show notes for this as well. But I did, um, just quickly, I wanted to, um, we were talking about the, the, towards the end of the first hour, they were talking a little bit about the White House Council on Environmental Quality, people like James, uh, Connington, um, and also, uh, later, um, the, uh, um, what's his, uh, Samuel, uh, Thernstrom, uh, who was the Director of Communications for the White House Council on Environmental Quality. Um, and Jenna, I just wanted to get your, your take on this. And again, this is more, you know, I guess like a, an opinion, um, than necessarily, uh, like a, a fact or anything. But I mean, do, you know, what did, what do you think was in it for the White House Council on Environmental Quality? And someone like James Connington, who, as you mentioned before, um, he said some very questionable things, uh, related to global warming. Um, who, uh, and also, I mean, while we're on the topic, so did Christine Todd Whitman, um, even in her congressional testimony, you know, she had this sort of, uh, glib little comment about, uh, you know, how the, the science is still out. Uh, she basically, you, you know, she said that, well, you know, since scientists still question global warming, some of the, you know, the scientists questioned, uh, you know, how much asbestos was really in the air is essentially what she said, uh, in her congressional testimony. But, what do you, do you think that there was, um, you know, what, what drove people like Connington to um, basically lie and even alter things that the EPA was coming out with? I mean, again, is this just part of the rah rah patriotism? We've got to get back to work, show up those terrorists that they can't defeat us. We'll build a bigger tower. Um, or is this just, I mean, negligence that they just didn't really, I don't know, they didn't care, they weren't paying attention, that the, the I mean, is this also just a matter of, uh, you know, the, the focus shifting to we got to kill the terrorists? What do you think? Many things. <laughs> First of all, um, as I was saying before, EPA had protocols, but what I think the effort was after 9-11 was deliberately to overturn those protocols and set a new precedent because they knew that there were going to be other environmental disasters. And if they cleaned up after 9-11 properly, they would have had to clean up something like the BP Gulf oil spill. They would have had to, you know, um, clean up the entire Gulf Coast in the wake of that. And they knew that such disasters would happen because they knew that they were seeking more recondite, more uh, abstruse forms of oil, harder to get at using more questionable technology. They knew that something like BP was going to happen, and they didn't want to have to rehabilitate the whole country after that. So that's why we were used to overturn the previous precedents, I believe. Um, I wanted to say something else about Connaughton. First of all, he came from the asbestos industry, and the law firm that he had been at before he joined the White House was called Sidley Austin Brown and Root. No, Brown and Wood. It was also the firm where Obama met his wife Michelle. So you don't huh. have to think it's you know only the Republicans are the bad guys. This law firm had a very kind of incestuous relationship with the White House where people would come and go. They'd spend two years in the White House and they'd return to the law firm and somebody else would go. And in the first appendix in Ground Zero Wars, I took it off their website. All these people who were going back and forth between the White House and this Sidley Austin and... Um, Strangely enough, they had their offices in the World Trade Center. Mm. But on that day, nobody was there except for one person. And in the account 
that I found of their behavior following 9-11. There's an enormous amount of exuberance and self-congratulation that they were so well prepared that um, they had duplicated all the records and sent them to, I think it was New Jersey or someplace like that, so that the records were salvageable. And plus they made the extraordinary move, coincidental move, on September 1st, 2001, of doubling their insurance. I'll leave wow. you with that. <laughs> I mean... Ugh, it, it's uh, yeah, it's uh, what it, what it, what an amazing coincidence, right? What uh, what great luck that they had uh, yeah, to and, to do and this. In the account, I'm not sure that account still exists on the net, but um, when I first stumbled upon them, I found it and I had the URL for it. Uh, when they announced that at a large meeting of all their employees, there was a great burst of applause because I guess nobody really thought about the implications. Truly fascinating. And then this guy is, of course, the you know then positioned to help uh, in the the cover up of the the health effects, uh, and certainly to yeah. push uh, an extremely uh, just. I mean. I don't even know the, the words to, to talk about this. I mean, they were altering memos from the EPA. They were pushing all sorts of phony science and, and whatnot. Uh, truly uh, disturbing. Um, quickly, though, just or, or broadening this out a little bit. Um, and again, I, I, um, I just want to kind of gauge uh, how you feel about this or what you think or what you make of this. I mean, uh, I mean, what does this say uh, about the the government um, in, in general? When the, I mean the the beyond, I mean we can look at we could probably spend another two hours just talking about uh, the numerous you know signs and uh, you know people that were missed leading up to nine eleven um, you know and uh, groups like Alex Station at the CIA um, which seem to be you know uh, I don't know, not uh, passing along important information. I mean, there's all of that kind of side of it. But then when you, you take a, a step back and you look at, you know, say people like uh, Conanton, who, of course, you know, he's safe. Um, he's OK. Uh, his law firm, you know, his former law firm, they, they all made money off of this, essentially. And when you look at how they treat the the enormity of this health crisis and the lengths to which the government um, both on a federal and on a local level as well. I mean, we, we touched on Giuliani a little bit. Went in order to kind of cover this up. I mean, what do you think that really says about uh, the government in general and and how they even view, uh, you know, people like you and I? Um, I know that's a very broad question, Jenna, but I, I would love to kind of um, get your take on it, especially as someone that has studied nine uh, eleven. Um, you know, certainly from the, the health side of this. Uh, but, you know, again, I'm sure you're, you're, you know, you're well versed in, you know, the work of like John Gold, Michael Rupert and others. I mean, what do you make of that? I mean, what does that say about, uh, the, you know, the American government? See, what John Gold says simply is we were lied to about 9-11. And I think it's right to take that kind of conservative approach. Mm. Um, you, you're not going to wildly accuse people. So what it tells you is that you simply cannot trust them. If you look at what the Russian government, Ukrainian governments did after Chernobyl, when you look at what the Japanese government did after Fukushima, you understand that they're all interested in placating the public and uh, they, they'll even tell you that, and I've even heard citizens say that, well, if they had told everybody the truth, the public would have panicked. And uh, that's not legitimate, because first of all, when 9-11 happened, uh, people behaved rather well. If you hear them give accounts of going down the stairs, you know, for 80 stories or something, those who made it out, they were solicitous of each other. Many were heroic. And so what? They feel panic. It doesn't mean they go insane. They do mm. appropriate things. I didn't hear stories of people um, 
behaving irrationally. This word panic is inappropriate. So you can't trust them, and unfortunately, it's very hard to know whom you can trust. So you have to be on the ground yourself and listen to the testimony, and it takes a great deal of work to discern who can be trusted, and it also takes time. You know, uh, uh, totally, and I I, uh, I tend to, when you know, when people ask me uh you know, about 9-11, I, I uh, tend to take John Gold's that we were lied to. Um, I think both because it, that's just the most, that's the most factual, um, you know, especially like, uh, you know, you can, you can get into the, well, maybe I'll, I'll ask you, Jen, I mean, what do you make of the, the sort of 9-11 research community or 9-11 truth? I mean, it seems to, of uh, of John Gold and I have talked about this, uh, Robbie Martin and I have uh, discussed this on the show as well. I mean, it, it seems to have really kind of fallen apart. Um, and uh, I, I'm just curious what your take on it is. I mean, the people doing research, I mean, it seems that the, you know, the, of course the loudest voices in the room are the craziest, you know, talking about fucking holograms and, you know, nobody died and, and all sorts of nonsense like that. Um, whereas, you know, on a, daily basis right now people are getting sick and dying because of the uh toxins after 911 i mean what do you what do you um think of the the sort of 911 research community or has it just sort of completely fallen apart you again you have to choose whom you're going to listen to so hmm. what mike rupert used to say was that <laughs> You deal with facts. You deal with things you can prove. And even if your speculations, your hunches are correct, if you don't have the proof, don't talk about them because people are going to argue and they're going to say, yes, but what about this? In other words, opinions are not helpful. They only distract everybody and people get head up about them. Just give the facts. Mike Rupert has an article, which um, I hope you know, called, oh, I think, oh, Lucy, you got a lot yep. of explained yep. to do. And he lists one newspaper article after another of events leading up to 9-11. These are major papers. These are not we websites from out of the blue. It's Le Figaro and it's The Guardian and things like that. And... So you want to say, well, that's cockamamie bullshit? Good <laughs> luck. Um, and he also, for that reason, and I think John Gold agrees, did not go into discussion of physical evidence. Like, you know, I don't even want to grace it with a mention. But I, I know what, what you, you mean. Gonna, I know you know. <laughs> what are you going to prove? For hmm. instance, um, I was asked early on to provide dust from people's apartments to see if there was this thermite. Right. Which, okay. Yeah. And I refused to do it because suppose you did find thermite and it came from somebody's apartment. You haven't done appropriate chain of custody. You don't know who was in that apartment. Yep. Did this person have a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a mother or a superintendent who came to fix the stove? Anybody could have put the so-called thermite in there. So it's not, it's throw it out the window. You can't use it. Not valid in a court case and not valid in argument. So of the 9-11 community, the people I respect are the people who concentrate on the facts. Mm. That would be Mike Rupert, John Gold, um, Nikos, what is he called? Nick Levis, Jamie Hecht, I mean, Mark mm. Rabinowitz at oilempire.us, mm. etc. Well, just um, just quickly, because I the the you know I know uh, I I still get uh, you know people commenting oh you know about thermite this and that and you know my my thing is also always just like you know you're just saying what if you found it the chain of custody what if you found I mean I don't really care um I don't you know d does that what does that really prove one way or another I mean who put it there I mean are you you're never going to discover that I mean I'm actually much more concerned with, um, you know, there are people like Christine Todd Whitman who should be in jail um, for yeah. endangering millions of lives. Um, 
nanothermite on the, I mean, okay, but are you actually ever going to solve that? No. I mean, that's why it's such a, a, a great, you know, rabbit hole to suck people into because it goes nowhere. There is no end result. I'd much rather see, um, you know, uh, Christine Todd Whitman go to prison for covering up, uh, you know, millions of people getting sick. I mean, the same goes for James Conanton. Um, you know, I know that uh, pe- people always uh, go on and, you know, uh, have attacked, uh, you know, me and John Gold for, we always talk about the Saudis. Um, and, oh, well, what about this group and that group? Well, you can, there's so much evidence that really kind of, you know, brings the Saudis to people's attention. Um, I mean, they're, they're guilty. Some of them are guilty of, of being part of this. And you can prove it. Um, I think much like, um, you know, what uh, Michael Rupert would have said. I mean, there's what you can actually prove, and then there's just, you know, nanothermite. <laughs> and it's yeah. just sort of irrelevant, um, to me at least, in the long run. Um, I don't really care uh, about those sorts of things. I mean, it, it, it's very much like the – you mentioned the physical stuff. I mean, I, I've become – I don't want to get too off topic, but I, I've become very – just uh, uh, I don't know, bored with the whole building seven and you know architects and engineer. And I'm not attacking them. I think that they've they've done a lot to raise people's awareness. But ultimately, um, that's really just sort of like a, a a thing you can point to as a isn't this strange? There's and and yes, there there is something to that. But where does it go? You know, what, what's the end result? Um, or is it just uh, basically a slogan that you can use that, of course, gets turned against you later? Um, you know, and, and people say, oh, you believe in that? I'm sure you've heard that millions of times. Yep. Um, it, and it, it's just uh, – it's it's really sad too though because I think like um, especially when we're, we're talking about the, the health effects, this is still happening right now. Um, and maybe very uh, quickly, Jenna, you can just um, – uh, maybe talk a little bit of it, um, anything you have to say on the um, – I mean like the victims fund uh, is continually being slashed. Uh, and, and how is this affecting people to this day still? Right. Uh, I'm, I'm Googling cancer 9-11 to see what comes up, if I can get some numbers for you. And I uh, – well, anyway, I – can't do that fast enough but there have been thousands of cases of cancer we're very soon approaching the number that's going to exceed the number of deaths from the health effects are going to exceed the number of deaths on the day itself and that's within 20 years but the incubation period for cancer many of the different forms of cancer that people are going to get is far more than 20 years so we have not yet seen the peak of this um, effect, but we do have very alarming numbers of people who are sick and dying, including among some of the uh, students who were in the Ground Zero area and some at Stuyvesant, and they're part of that Michael Barish um, firm that I mentioned to you before. Mm. And is that a is that a place that people can go if they if they are listening uh, and they uh, know someone that's been affected or they themselves have uh, developed uh, illnesses because of that? Is it Michael Barish a, a good you know starting point? I believe it's one of them. And then, as you said, the victim compensation fund. It's called Barish McGarry Law Firm, Lawyers for the Nine Eleven Community. Good. We uh, will definitely link up to that. Um, and yeah. yeah, again, there's also the the um, uh, the victims compensation fund, uh, which I mean, you know, uh, uh, again, people love to, uh, as I said, exploit the trauma of 9/11 for financial and political gain, uh, and everybody, you know, loves the firefighters and the first responders. Yet, uh, you know, Congress and, and the president continually uh, attempt to cut, um, you know, funds for these people. Um, which is just I mean, beyond uh, insulting and disturbing. And again, I mean, it really just goes to prove that they, they do not, um, and I'm, you know, general statement, but generally the government does not care about us. Uh, we are fully expendable. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just sort of one of those things they want us to kind of move on. Um, 
Uh, Jenna, though, I know I, I've kept you um, for quite some time. Um, just a, one or two little final things, and I'll let you go. Um, one, uh, the first one is, um, you know, what do you make of the EPA's legacy, and and what do you see, you know, for the EPA going forward? Because it seems as if they've they've since nine eleven continued to. Um, I mean, now they it, it's it's sort of like par for the course that they're going to cover up an environmental disaster. Um, you know, what do you what do you think of uh, in terms of the future of the EPA? Oh yeah, yeah. It's going in the wrong direction. You said something a second ago that reminded me they don't give a hoot about us. Well, we don't give a hoot about ourselves because Mm -hmm. the Stuyvesant parents were also ignoring uh, their own senses, their own common sense, and the words of legitimate scientists to bring their kids back to the school. And I'm not saying that they didn't care about their children. I think they did. But they... um, were blinded by their own ambition. It's a very ambitious population. And Senator Chuck Schumer's daughter attended the school at that time. We thought in our naivete that he was going to help us get the barge moved. Well, he wasn't remotely interested in that because he is Wall Street's representative in Congress. And his wife had been the, I believe, head of the something, Department of transportation that had put the barge there so they're sending their own child into this you know the maw of the beast uh and they were not the only parents to do that there were parents whose children attended stuyvesant but the parents themselves worked for aol time warner or something like that they continued to spout the party line Mm. so of course the government's not going to care about us (laughs) <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I think it's true. And, we, we, you know, there's uh, self-reflection is something uh, that I, uh, we as, a, you know, Americans do less and less. And uh, certainly 9-11, the aftermath of that is something that we, you know, we should we should be reflecting on. We should have been thinking at the time. Um, and again, too, I mean, it, it's it's that um, just the um, uh, what, uh, you know, people like at the Sierra Club um, were, were saying uh, is just that, you know, trust your gut. You know it's wrong. You know that, that the smell, that the dust, that instinct, instinctively, you're aware that this is bad for you. Um, and then to just sort of completely kind of acquiesce to that because, you know, we, we've, I don't know, we, we've got to show those terrorists and, and we're not afraid and, and all of this kind of stuff is, is just, it's so toxic. Uh, both uh, figuratively and uh, literally. Um, and then um, just finally, Jenna, I, I know because we, we've mentioned um, Michael Rupert a few times, and uh, I think I would be remiss if I just didn't, um, you know, if, if you didn't uh, uh, talk a little bit about him. I know you, you've written uh, a book, um, Scout, a memoir of investigative journalist Michael C. Rupert. And just tell the listeners a little bit about um, the book. And, and uh, you were uh, very close with Michael Rupert, uh, right? Yes. I worked with him starting in 2004, and then when he his computers were smashed, all six computers at his office in Oregon, he understood that it was a warning, and he left his website, which had been extremely powerful. There were 30 members of Congress who um, subscribed to it, but he gave it all up, and weirdly enough, fled to Venezuela. Then that didn't work out, and he fled to my house. (laughs) And um, that was a very interesting year, which is what the book is about mostly. His work was not duplicated by anybody else. And uh, the book is Crossing the Rubicon. It's a must-read if you're interested in the truth about 9-11. And And, and indeed, just about the world in general. Yeah, but it's predominantly 9-11. And wait, what's the subtitle here? It's uh, The Decline of the American Empire at the End of the Age of Oil. Mm. Then there's a movie which is consists of a... I'm, I'm sorry that it sounds boring in the description, but it's not. It's an interview with him, and it's directed by Chris Smith, who also directed The Yes Men, very funny mm. movie. Chris Smith is an extremely successful director. 
And that movie got extremely positive reviews, I think, in The Guardian and Roger Ebert. So it's an interview with him, but it's about the collapse of the world in his own personal collapse. You can see that reflected in the former. So if you wanted to... <laughs> you're opening a real can of worms here. <laughs> he, his research about 9-11 went into the put options and the war games that were taking place that day, the put options that had been placed on United and American Airlines. And which were way out of whack with the usual put options graph. And the significance of that is that the CIA monitors put options in real time. So it's not simply that the terrorists were benefiting from by placing them. It's that the CIA knew that, had to know that. That's what they're in the business of. And then with the war games, he talked about how the morning of 9-11, there were at least five or six war games we know about that diverted planes from the East Coast to northern Canada and Alaska. Some planes that remained, some of the few that remained, were sent off in the wrong direction towards Russia at half speed because Dick Cheney said we didn't want to break windows. Um, and... One of the war games introduced chaff onto the radar screen so that any pilots who might have wanted to head out on their own in pairs would not have known where to go because they would have looked on the radar screen and said, is this real or is this exercise? And that's a quote from a telephone call. Mm. So that was some of the work in crossing the Rubicon. Uh, plus he talks about the project for the New American Century, which consisted of a bunch of neocons wanting to build up the American military, but knowing that the American public would not be in favor, quote-unquote, absent a new Pearl Harbor, which they then got. Unless Pierce is uh, speaking to his mute button, which is possible, uh, it could be that uh, he lost connection with his computer. But about Mike Rupert, really quickly, just for the listener, uh, this is also the guy who stood up at that meeting in Los Angeles many years ago uh, with, uh, uh, what is it, a deputy director of the CIA. And, uh, John Deutsch. What, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, director John Deutsch. Correct, right. And I'm, I'm just saying for a listener who maybe doesn't necessarily know Mike Rupert or his work now, uh, I, th I think they when they go looking him up, they would find this too, or they should anyway. Uh, and uh, w w would you mind describing that for somebody who maybe never heard of that? Oh, gosh, that was in Los Angeles, and he um, talks about, I think it was called Pegasus Amadeus, and a couple of uh, operations that he knew of, which involved the CIA itself dealing drugs. Well, the place was in an uproar when he revealed that, and John Deutsch was removed shortly afterwards. Right. Or I don't know if... Or, or he resigned. I, I think he resigned um, uh, after uh, that, uh, which is a, a, a really amazing. If people haven't ever seen that, um, it, it is just. Uh, I mean, an amazing clip of Michael Rupert. Um, I mean, just really laying it all out there with, you know, I mean, specifics too, dates and times and, and all sorts of stuff. I mean, it, it's a, a truly amazing clip. Um, and it's a it's a shame, uh, Jenna, that, you know, I, I feel like Michael Rupert is sort of, I don't know, but the researchers and, you know, the alternative media or conspiracy culture, or whatever, you know, as sort of, uh, I don't know, been a bit maybe neglectful of, of uh, understanding the, the the true magnitude of uh, Michael Rupert's work. And, and I think he's been a little overlooked um, and uh, and certainly people, you know, that have kind of made careers. You know, after the fact, I don't think, um, you know, give credit where credit is due when it when it comes to the stuff that Michael Rupert has done. Um, so uh, I definitely, you know, people should check out his work. They should certainly check out uh, your book, Scout, a memoir of investigative journalist Michael C. Rupert. And they should also check out your um, your book, Ground Zero Wars, the fight to reveal the lies of the EPA in the wake of 9-11 and clean up lower Manhattan. 
Um, Jenna, I know I've kept you uh, probably long enough, but um, very uh, briefly before we let you we let you go, please do tell the listeners um, where they can go to uh, get copies of your books. Um, is there any you know websites, anything like that that you want to plug? Please do so. Oh, my books are available on Amazon. Thank you for asking. Mm. That was easy. <laughs> um, and uh, and of now, course, website you- yes. The website would be Mike's website, which is now at fromthewilderness.net. Fromthewilderness.net. We will, of course, link up to that uh, in the the show notes for this. Again, I encourage people to check out Jenna's uh, books and writing as well. We'll we'll have some links, um, uh, you know, from some of the uh, you know various articles and stuff. You there's a, a series of really good articles. You, um, I think Counterpunch. Um, published that you wrote about the the health effects and um you know just um quickly Jenna Orkin is there anything you want to leave the listeners with anything that um you know we didn't get to to talk about or touch on uh, any kind of final thoughts uh, regarding any of the stuff we, we've uh, discussed today oh you did a great job thank you very much Oh, excellent. Well, uh, Jenna Orkin, it was a pleasure having you on the show. Uh, I would love to have you back on any time, really, um, to discuss, uh, you know, whatever you'd like. So I, I hope that we can get you back on the show. Uh, and once again, uh, thanks for joining us, and I encourage people to check out all of your writing. Thank you, Jenna Orkin. Thank you. Hey, everybody. So once again, that was Jenna Orkin, the uh, writer and journalist behind several books, including Scout, a memoir of investigative journalist Michael C. Rupert, and Ground Zero Wars, the fight to reveal the lies of the EPA in the wake of 9-11 and clean up Lower Manhattan. Um, Very interesting topic. Um, I am uh, my apologies for my uh, computer crashing uh, yet again there. But uh, Chuck, I think you you uh, gracefully stepped in to uh, help me out there, and I appreciate that uh, immensely. Listen, not uh, not a worry there at all. Here's what I did: is I just picked up the last logical thing I could think of regarding Mike Rupert, and yeah. uh, you know, and very important. I think it's uh, been forgotten. Uh, of course, uh, now you probably didn't want to discuss this too much with Jenna, but uh, Mike met kind of a tragic end there. Yes, uh, which in, you in- know. Um, and I think uh, I I, I want to say this was uh, – Jenna was on um, J.G. Michael's show, Parallax Views, uh, maybe a month or so ago. Very good interview as well. Mm. And um, J.G. did kind of broach that subject a bit more. And, and I didn't know this, but Jenna said um, in that interview that, um, you know, that uh, Michael Rupert had tried to kill himself uh, I think once or twice before that or he had threatened to do it. Um so, uh, you know, very, very uh, disturbing um, and really is like seriously a tragedy. I mean, um, I've never have you seen Chuck? Have you seen the movie Collapse? Well, you, you know what? Uh, what? What? Uh, he, here's what I know. I haven't seen that movie. No. But uh, if you remember the journalist from uh, what was it? San Jose there who uh, Gary Webb. Yeah. Gary Webb. Uh, at the time of his death. There was a bit of an email chain that was going on, and uh, I was in on that chain. And uh, Mike Rupert was talking about what happened with Gary uh, during that chain, and there was a, a, this, you know, possibility of what actually went down there. Which, if anybody doesn't know, you want to talk about another movie? There's a movie called Kill the Messenger out there now. Uh, um, you know, and about I think Gary Michael Webb. Rupert was like a was he involved? Uh, there's somebody I think. He was involved in something like that, in some like advisory role or something. Well, Mike Rupert had been an advisor to a lot of people for scripts and documentaries and things like that. That's another thing, too, is that he had participated in a lot of these sort of like, um, I, I, I want to call them impromptu think tanks that go on sometimes. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, so I was involved in that and uh, a private uh, in, interaction kind of went down between him and I where I got the sense that, you know, the guy had definitely been uh, uh, sort of plagued by something, uh, which he kind of sensed in me as well, <laughs> which was really strange because, uh, you know, and, and, and it's really odd, too, because there there have been a couple of people. Um, Liam Sheff is another guy who uh, was kind of an outside-the-box writer. Uh, I don't know if you – have you ever heard of Liam Sheff? 
Uh, the name sounds familiar, but I don't know off the top of my head. But Liam Sheff uh, wound up going to the dentist one day and, and wound up with like a toxic reaction and all this crazy stuff and ended mm. up with such a horrible case of tinnitus that it was it was literally like racking his sanity. Uh, and he wound up taking his own life for it. Uh, you know, and, and I considered Liam a friend. Um, and it, it just, uh, it, it, it's rather odd sometimes that, uh, some of the people that I, I'm not putting out any sort of conspiratorial idea here. I'm simply saying that the things that wind up plaguing some of us, uh, it, it seems really bizarre. These are not the stories that are told. In a lot of places, what really goes on in our personal lives and uh, some of the damage that's done and some of the really weird kind of odd situations that come up. And uh, I, I don't think the entire truth of what happened with Mike, for, for, if a listener doesn't know, I mean, Mike allegedly one day just put out a message because uh, he was doing a radio show and, and his website and he had written that book and he had done a lot of uh, uh, journalism in the past and. Uh, you know, and, and a lot of stuff that was uh, very much questioning many official explanations on everything from CIA and crack involvements in uh, Los mm -hmm. Angeles to 9-11 to you name it, Gary Webb's death. Uh, you know, the guy was all over the map as far as but but legitimately uh, investigating these things, uh, you know, and you can say whatever you like about his conclusions, but. The point is that he, he had a, a definitely an ethic involved here that was um, seemingly a little more professional <laughs> than your average citizen researcher. And um, just one day, apparently, he put out a message and uh, walked into the woods, according to the story I heard, and took his life. Uh, again, you know, um, suicide is a plague on our society anyway that nobody wants to talk about. Uh, you know, whether it's veterans or it's people that are in high pressure situations or it's, uh, mm -hmm. you know, empathetic individuals who are studying dark subjects, uh, quite frankly, uh, these things can get to you, man. Mm. And, uh, you know, so I, I, I would hazard to wonder if that's in fact what uh, got to, to Michael Rupert after a while. Um, uh, I mean, uh, uh, especially the, the I, again, I think, I don't know, we're, we're so quick to jump uh, to whatever is like the hip thing you know everyone's i don't know the, well, that's the thing q and on yeah like, they I don't, don't understand wanna... you know michael rupert lived this i mean and and yeah. was really doing uh, groundbreaking journalism right. I, I don't i don't know if people like i mean i know my listeners are probably aware right. but um you know he was really above and beyond and and like um jenna was saying i mean the film collapse got like universe like even the new york times you know, was praising it. Right. This is the conspiracy theorist, Michael Rupert. <laughs> well, right. Um, and, and, my, and Mike Rupert had been on the History Channel. I mean, there's a lot yes. of places you can find the guy. But my point is that, uh, you know, it, it was one of those cases, though, where I felt like almost nobody got the full story because it was mostly residing in his head. And, uh, you know, in, even that situation with Liam Shep, he came on my show and talked about it before he did it, actually. Uh, and, uh, it was just like, look, if I can't take this much longer, that's what, the, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to check out, uh, you know, and so he, he said something in advance, but Mike Rupert just kind of one day put out that message. And, uh, I, I think, uh, you know, some type of misery had definitely been stalking him. Um, there are others that have said that he was, you know, very ill physically or whatever, but th there was a lot of speculation and there was immediately the, you know, jump to, Oh, well, you know, crisis actor conspiracy theory, right. they killed him. I don't know that that's the case. Uh, I don't know that that's not the case, though. Um, what, what I say is that, you know, respectfully, I leave it open because I don't have the evidence. And I think that would be the thing that uh, <laughs> that he himself would encourage from the outside of it. You know what I mean? But it's uh, it's certainly worthy of mention and uh, and, and, and something that, uh, I'm, I'm glad is, you know, covered on occasion respectfully now. Um, so, you know, it, it's just one of those things. So when, when I heard you talking about Mike Rupert, it was very easy for me to pick up in that spot. Now, <laughs> yes. Now, earlier on in the broadcast, folks, 
there was a, a little bit of difficulty there because I actually put my headphones down thinking that I didn't need to pay attention to Pierce for five minutes. And, of course, <laughs> that was the five minutes that uh, you decided you were going to close out the first hour and I wasn't there. So my apologies to you. Uh, and, and this no, way, that's fine. I thought you were just so <laughs> engrossed by the conversation. Uh, you weren't, you know, you weren't, um, seeing the chat or something. Well, no, I took, I actually took off the headphones to, uh, to monitor visually what was good. See, here's the thing. I will con- constantly check the stream to make sure that, uh, we're connected, we're broadcasting, we're recording, and I have multiple things going on. So I thought I had a few more minutes than I did. Because uh, let, let's just say I, I produce more than one person, and uh, <laughs> some people don't watch the clock very well, uh, and they push it, you know, all the way to well, you know, I'm only like thirty seconds late, and it's like, yeah, but you're thirty seconds over the hour in which you wanted to squeeze in fifty five minutes, or you know, so I constantly have mm-hmm. that little tug of war going on. And, uh, uh, quite frankly, I forgot that, uh, that Pierce is a lot more on time than other people. So I should have been <laughs> listening at that point and sort of dropped the ball, but I tried to make up for it by, uh, by picking up where I thought logically you would go next, which is, you know, let's, let's make people aware in case they are not aware of, uh, Mike Rupert, the, uh, you know, the kind of span, the spectrum, if you will, of things that he was involved in and had an impact on. Uh, if you're going to talk about, you know, somebody who was close to him respectfully uh, uh, telling his story, uh, I, I thought that that should be included. And I jumped in there just long enough to uh, make it almost seem seamless. She said, Pierce, are you there? And I said, well, maybe he's talking to his mute button. That was my answer. Uh, so, yeah, well, that would be me, too. I, I always do that on your Well, show. I wasn't sure. And that does yeah. happen occasionally. Uh, and, and, and I've done it, too. So, uh, so again, you know, look, th- this is why it's live. And, uh, uh, again, I think you did a really spectacular show today. Um mm-hmm. You know, and, and well, you I know, didn't I mean to jump too, in the, the, here, but this is what <laughs> makes live radio uh, kind of fun is that spontaneity. And and even though it is a little like um, it's nerve wracking, it can even it can even feel I think at times it's like awkward for the listeners, you know, like, oh, God, you know, like here we go. You know, Pierce jumped the gun and now he's got to, you know, fill in some time and, you know, we're not ready to cut. I mean, I, I think all of that, though, it, it makes it so much more exciting. I mean, that's why things like, you know, live theater um, that's why people, you know, that's why theater still exists. Um, right. that's why, uh, you know, it, anything live. I mean, that's why we go see, you know, sporting events and stuff. Cause you don't know what's going to happen. Well, again, um, and so even, I think even it's even always like fun. Music. It adds an element that you don't get in a podcast. Well, see, and even like live music, you know, anybody can play the same song 3000 times. Sure. But 3001, that mm. one time they might screw something up and it, it's not necessarily about, you want to see the fail, but you want to see the recovery. Uh, right. which, which I think is very cool. And <laughs> this is, yeah. this is what went on here today. Uh, uh, so, you know, so I say, and you said during the break, by the way, this is, you know, me breaking that, uh, that, that private time we have to talk, uh, <laughs> over to the listener, but you said during the break, oh, I could cut that out. And I said, no, don't cut it out. Now you have no reason to cut it out because it would make no sense if you cut yeah, it out. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. so there you go. Uh, my, my production, my production, uh, uh duties are, are well intact for today. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I've given but the I listeners think, you know, something the, interesting. The listeners like some of the the inside baseball. I think um, you know you just see and and seriously, I mean it's like um, it, it's you know it's it's hard to uh, produce a live radio show, or I mean, let alone it's it's difficult enough uh, to produce a live radio show, but to do what you're doing, Chuck. I mean, you're 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 managing you know a a network as well, along with producing my show and Aaron's show and. Uh, you know, I mean, just soon to be more shows as well. Um, yeah, it's a lot that's uh, going on. And uh, Skype is a pain in the ass. Um, my computer <laughs> is a real pain in the ass. Yeah. Um, and still need to get that uh, sorted at some point. But, um, you know, that, that kind of stuff happens. But um, but that's why we do it, you know. It's sort of like, I don't know, uh, on a podcast there's something that's so – it's so controlled and to me and maybe this is uh maybe a little over the top or something but it it's like it feels like everything is so uh controlled and pre you know packaged in such a way in like society um and especially like in the media that we consume you know everything is so slick and cool and there's right. an app for everything and it's nice to know that um you know we're we're working without a 
you know, working without a net here. And, um, you know, when my computer crashes, there's nothing we can really do about that other than, you know, hope that Chuck jumps in with some, <laughs> some good comments about Michael Rupert. <laughs> well, you know, it, it was either that or immediately go to, you know, the extra uh, Porkins policy theme I've got lined up in the background. Right, yeah. You know, and that's the other thing is that usually I'm like at the, you know, trigger basically with, with my finger itching. Uh, ready to click on something in case you need it or, you know, oh, gee, you know, I've got a little problem here. I got to go to a break, you know, and, and I'll have that ready for you within five seconds or three seconds or whatever, uh, because, you know, I'm, I'm trying to make sure I've got all avenues covered, but, uh, but today was like, you know what? I've got a few minutes here, so I'm going to go and take a listen to this and take my headphones off and, uh, because I've, I've got, my show to do and another two hour sure. show to produce. So I'm like, eh, I'll take the headphones off for a couple oh, of minutes. Oh, I mean, you know, we, we know, uh, <laughs> we know people out there that have just, you know, walked into the other room while, uh, you know, producing, uh, shows and stuff like that. Or, or, um, fall you know, asleep. it happens. Or you well, gotta, you gotta take a leak, you know? <laughs> I, I, I've had a producer fall asleep before. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, you know, we're not naming names. No, but, no um, not naming any names. Know, it, I'm just it saying happens. it was, it, it, it's, um, it, it's pretty funny. It's like, is the show over? I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. Because. <laughs> You know, and I mean, end. again, you know, I'm not not uh, naming names, but you know, there's there are times when you know me as the host, I'm just you know, I'm not paying attention. Um, some t- you know, I mean, that just happens. Um, it, it's it's not like you, you're doing it on purpose necessarily. Or you're like, oh god, here we go, boring conversation or something. But you know, sometimes I'm I'm on the air, I'm getting a text from work, or uh, you know, uh, Amy has some question for me about something, and or you know, um. I don't know, any number of things. Oh, or sometimes so, yeah, you see, really are just staring off into space, you or, know, and, or, and then suddenly, <laughs> um, you know, what the hell was that guest saying? I, I like when done, they throw it back to you. Yeah, and let me tell you, I've done a variety of things on the air really quickly. I'll list a couple of the most hilarious ones. I've accidentally like lit something on fire because of smoke while I'm on air. So I've accidentally lit like a garbage can on fire while I've been on air. I have had uh, stuff spill all over my computer while I was on the air. I have had, mm-hmm. uh, you know, my, my then three year old run into the room and literally knock everything off of my desk while I was on the air. I've had, uh, <laughs> Oh, I, I had uh, one time, um, uh, I think this was on Aaron's show, uh, and it might have been, no, I think it might have been when he was live, uh, when he started doing the live show, but, um, I was in my room, and it was, it was, it was like midnight here, uh, and it was like dark in my room, and I was all ready to, to record and whatever, and I looked over on the wall, and there was a roach, probably the size of like a, you know, a, a chipmunk crawling up my wall and i at first i thought okay i'm just going to ignore it you know and and <laughs> i don't know what i was thinking you know and i hate big roaches it's they're just disgusting it was one of those ones that just like i mean it, it doesn't die you, you stomp on it 10 times and it's still good and i you know was freaking out and then it started crawling around and um you know i just told aaron um i think i said something crazy like uh, oh someone's at my door can you hold on a second and I put my mic on mute. I took um, my like winter boots out, and I almost put a hole in the wall, killing this roach. <laughs> um, and then the the rest of the episode, I was just like my heart was racing. I was looking all over the you know the the room. Is there going to be another one? Um, well, that's, so, that's yeah, the that, problem. that kind of stuff happens. Well, see, that's the problem, especially in New York, is when you see one big roach, you know there's more. Oh, uh, yeah, exactly. Well, that's the thing. And I was just, am I going to sleep in my bed tonight? You know, what's happening? Yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> are, are they going to evict me? Uh, you know, they, yeah, they got attitude right. problems in New York, man. Uh, the roaches do. And, uh, you know, hey, hey, listen, I can't I can't say much. Here in Georgia, sometimes they got wings, baby. Uh, they are oh, they're yeah. really oh, bizarre. I, I know. I, just the less... <laughs> Said about them, the better. Um, I mean, they're they're multicolored yeah, the, here. You you should see the color variety I get out of these things. It they're really I know, strange. When you get that that sort of that light brown kind of uh, you know muddy color. Then you get like a jet black one, and 
Oh, no, I just they, no. They, I had they, they, one that um they was have in like, my bathtub. Oh no! And, wait, wait, wait! This gets weirder. Hold up! You, sometimes I got the white head. It reminds you of like looking at the fly oh. from the distance. You know what I mean? Like oh, from the nineteen sixties, yeah. where it's like, is that a human head on that roach? <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you oh. know, well, you know what's funny, Pierce, is you you've got like four minutes left now, uh, so I don't want to take up any more of your time. Of course, we could talk about cockroaches uh, next time we get together if you like. Like, but I'm not planning on it. Um, no. <laughs> so, you know, all up to you, brother. But you might want to close out your show with four minutes left. Yeah, I um, well, thank you for the update check. Thanks for <laughs> thanks for also just stepping in with a little. I really didn't have it. You know, I thought um, I, I would have Jenna for, for both hours. But we, we kind of I mean, we covered pretty much we covered actually every single question i think i had written down um but um so thanks for stepping in but um well with the four minutes remaining um you know uh, i once again i just want to encourage everyone to check out uh jenna orkin's work uh you know much i think uh you know in my opinion like um you know michael rupert gets overlooked i think jenna orkin's work really gets overlooked um both just in a general sense um that people aren't you know reading and, and sort of educating themselves about the health effects of 9-11, even though, as I, you know, we, we, we covered, we are soon to out, we are, we will in the next year or so, most definitely, um, outpace, uh, the, you know, the number of deaths on 9-11, um, in terms of the deaths of, of people that are just sick from the dust, truly disturbing, but also just within the, um, you know, I know I, I seem to have been doing a lot of, uh, episodes uh, revolving around 9-11 and stuff. And um, I think when we look at 9-11 research, 9-11 truth movement, the health effects are almost never discussed. Um, it, it's just, it's, it's not something that enters into, you know, like I said, it, it's, it's, um, you know, uh, John Gold was, was texting me when we were on the air, you know, it, it's, it's thermite, it's nanothermite, it's this kind of therm, you know, that's what people, um, you know, we'll, we'll glom onto not all the time. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of picking on uh, the, the thermite thing, but, uh, it's, it's, uh, the health effects are not something that's front and center and it really should be, uh, especially too, for the fact that, uh, you know, I, I could, you, we, it, you could make the case that this, the health effects are still happening, you know, that there are still, um, toxins, uh, lingering since 9-11, uh, certainly the the legacy of the EPA, I mean, it does not bode well, you know, knock on wood, God forbid there's another uh, environmental disaster on par or greater than the World Trade Center. I, I truly would be, you know, tempted to, if it was near me, I mean, to get out of there entirely because there's no way the EPA is going to clean it up. I mean, they're, they're, they didn't clean up 9-11. Why would they... Why would they clean up any other natural disaster? I mean, they really seem to be about damage control. And I know that, you know, um, I don't know, some people think it's, you know, sort of like a, a tree hugger thing to be, uh, you know, supportive of the EPA and the environment or whatever. But, uh, I mean, come on. I mean, it's, it's really just, it's, it's common sense. Um, and, uh, it's interesting. One of the things, uh, Jenna talking about with, uh, this, you know, James, uh, Connaughton and, you know, sort of, uh, d denying climate change and things like that. And, uh, you know, it's interesting, um, that, uh, that, you know, has certainly been on the rise. Um, and, uh, you know, is that kind of a legacy of the, the 9 11 stuff? But anyway, I think, um, we will wrap it up here. Next week, I'm going to have Ken Silverstein on the show, uh, to talk about his uh, recent, uh, return from Venezuela. Uh, Ken Silverstein is, of course, a co-founder, was a co-founder of Counterpunch and is also the proprietor of Hollywood, of, uh, WashingtonBabylon.com. So, uh, definitely going to be a fun episode. I think I'll have Ken for an hour and then maybe we'll open up the phone line. So until then, I will be talking to you all very soon. <laughs> <laughs>